I am a mechanical engineer and uh, I worked with corporate organizations. I started my career. I passed out as a mechanical engineer. I started my career as a customer support engineer. I was on the factory for a while. Uh, then I moved into sales. I moved into product management. Then I became the operations head. And then 20 years ago, I quit my corporate career and moved into the uh, commercial uh, consulting and training business where uh, I'm an engineer turned psychologist. And normally we are called the anthropologists. So we come with a management background. We come with a background in psychology, statistics. Uh, uh, we are researchers also. So we conduct a lot of uh, different areas of work. I, I write extensively. In fact, I'm considered to be amongst the top 7% people in the world with the amount of writing that I tend to do and the kind of publications that I tend to do. So don't worry, after this session also, there'll be a lot of content that will keep coming to you and you're free to read it because ultimately we are here to value add to all the students. So that's what it is. What do I wish to do now? Obviously, I will roll the presentation. Don't worry, focus on the presentations. Everything that I do here will be available to you perennially, eternally. Don't worry at all. Let's focus on this conversation. You don't need to take screenshots. You don't need to do anything. You will get everything that I talk about. Here. Don't worry at all. And if you need anything else, I'll be happy to generate uh, extra content also for you because I love to create content. So don't worry on that part also. Focus on this conversation. I'm going to cover the basics. This is not an engineer only talking to you. This is also a management consultant talking to you. We, we normally conduct our design thinking processes for fortune companies, and we really get involved in solving complex problems. And my promise, my forte is I'm the only person in the world who can create prototypes for complex management and engineering problems. Mostly uh, design thinking programs only get into lectures and they stop at lectures. But we, when we participate in our processes, we create prototypes. I have more than 40 prototypes for different corporates. Feel free to ask anything as long as it is not controlled in the intellectual property or under the non-disclosure agreement. I'll be very happy to help you in terms of the uh, information that you would need. Should I be constrained by the non-disclosure agreements? I will state it very clearly. As we proceed, please put your questions on the chat. Satish Patil is there. He's recording all the questions. Uh, after the break, I will take the first level of answers. That will be at 11.40. And before we wind up, like I said, I'll take the second round of answers. I'm now sharing a presentation for you. This presentation will roll till 11.30. There you go. It's called the Eternal Elements Web Mentoring Issue. It's a, there's a video of this that's available. Don't worry, you will get a complete access to the video library of all the design thinking uh, videos which are a part of the showcase. Uh, if uh, everything is visible for you, uh, please do go ahead and uh, you can ping it on the chat bot also, chat box also, so that Satish is able to control that. I've already introduced myself. Uh, like I said yesterday, a whole lot of areas that we work in, but I love psychology. This is the first slide which will put the perspective in terms of what are we discussing here. Now, if you look at design centric organization, that means you're actually talking about design thinking organizations. Now, if you look at design organizations per se, if you look at the brands which are listed here, you have Apple, you have Coca-Cola, you have Ford, you have IBM. And by the way, IBM is doing extensive work in the area of design thinking. Uh, okay, we're, we're hearing some background uh, voice, please. Can we mute that? Thank you. Uh, okay. So IBM, Nike, Whirlpool. Uh, in fact, Whirlpool design centers also, uh, I've heard that they use a lot of design thinking processes. A lot of companies which are into retail marketing also tend to do a lot of design thinking and Walt Disney, amazing. And Starbucks, I mean, I've been studying Starbucks for a long time. And if you look at the entire customer, ah, 
can you mute yourself please thank you yes i will take that but four failed i will take that let me first have the voices controlled yeah i like the question four failed i agree in india india is a very very complex market and i love the question that has been posed now let's understand why design thinking becomes all the more relevant in india design thinking becomes all the more relevant in india because if you look at the indian market typically we are culturally diverse uh the needs and the behaviors uh, that are happening across the country are completely different we are a hyper competitive market if you look at the number of consumers that exist here in india i mean in terms purely in terms of population we have extensive number of people here and therefore a lot of multinational organizations come into uh, the in, into the country now let's i work extensively with automotive and let me take this as a case study and let's understand what happens when we are getting into design thinking and why do companies tend to fail now i'm not really talking about a brand per se but i'm giving you indicators in terms of what happens whenever automotive companies come into india india is an extremely price sensitive market for sure there's no doubt about it but it's not that people don't pay premium in fact uh, my experience with uh the mercedes benz as a consultant my experience with audi as a user of audi i can share that with you that there is a premium market but what goes wrong what goes wrong is an organization may be a design thinking organization but are people down the line trained completely to implement design thinking now that becomes a big question mark because one of the things is most of the times organizations tend to have their own design thinking centers which are centrally controlled but they don't really cascade down design thinking to each and every individual person and therefore leaders local leaders in different countries or maybe the leader minus one which is a mid -le mid level people or the junior people in the organization when they are not trained to handle complex issues uh, the organization stalls completely a lot of times also design thinking is used only as a product centric practice now if design thinking is used as a product centric practice what happens is your strategies and your uh, you know the, the way you set up your supply chains in any country they may not be done through design thinking and therefore until and unless the organization on the whole is integrated in terms of design thinking across all the management Man. perspectives design thinking does you not message work. me through whatsapp no personally you send me a message i'll store madam asha would you like to mute yourself please no, thank you message through whatsapp through whatsapp thank you all right so what happens is uh, design thinking as a perspective whenever you're teaching as a faculty also you will have to tell the people you'll have to tell your students you'll have to tell the industry yes. oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you. okay you'll have to tell the industry that when you implement design thinking it has to be implemented across the entire organization in every function otherwise if you, if you do it in pockets it doesn't work having answered that question Let's come back to this slide and understand why design thinking is being considered as a futuristic competency. The World Economic Forum. If you get onto the website of World Economic Forum, uh, you will find a blog there on design thinking and why they think CEOs and senior leaders of organizations need to now focus on design thinking as a coveted competency. Now, this is a data slide in front of you. The data slide in front of you says that mostly organizations who have sustained their market capitalization over years are the ones who have invested in design thinking. Having said this, having understood the power of design thinking, a lot of corporate organizations in India also are now investing heavily in design thinking. And therefore, I think we as faculties need to bear this in mind 
that when we are teaching our students design thinking, we are actually making them absolutely employable. You are actually creating talent. You're creating mavericks. Now, who are mavericks? Whenever I teach design thinking, I talk about mavericks. Mavericks are a bunch of people who are extremely innovative. However, they're very strong on the control of implementation also. Now, interestingly, what happens is one may have learned design thinking, but if I'm not able to control the design thinking prototype project effectively during the scale up process or during the pilot process, at that point in time, design thinking can fail. Therefore, we need a bunch of mavericks in every organization and mavericks. I mean, the current research, which I was just reading, I was reading an Harvard research the other day, uh, I think just about three or four days ago. In that, what they're saying is that leaders of today are the ones who are not only visionaries, but also control implementation effectively. Now, if you see most of the brands which are here, now if you look at Apple, Apple is a complete design thinking organization. Now let's look at how Apple functions. Let's revisit the frame of design thinking. Let's see how. Uh, 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 Mr. Harsha, would you like to mute yourself, please? Thank you. All right. If you were to look at Apple, how would Apple move? Now, if you were to revisit the entire uh, journey of uh, design thinking, we, we realized yesterday the first step was empathize. Now, how would Apple go about empathizing? If you notice, uh, every time we use a phone, we are actually providing a lot of data, a lot of user data to Apple for sure. And while we are at the store, we may also be getting mapped in terms of our entire journey. And therefore, the empathy mapping is a continuous process at Apple, where they're constantly capturing data through the apps that we use, the screen time that we spend, and uh, definitely a lot of feedback that can come from users. While the empathize process is happening, they would also be looking at a problem definition converted into an opportunity definition, which will be what are the improvements or where is a shortfall that the product is currently facing and the opportunity statement, where is it that the market is, what is it that the market is needing and what kind of shortfalls need to be covered up. Obviously, there are a lot of ideas that they're also collecting in the market. There's, there's a lot of conversation happening within their organization also in terms of where the technology is moving, what kind of ideas need to be built in. So that's where the ideation process is ongoing for them for sure. After that, they come up with prototypes at regular intervals and they launch their products at regular intervals. In fact, Apple has moved into a space where we call about not only customer advocacy, but we are talking about customers becoming devotees. And when we talk about customers becoming devotees, we see lines for purchasing Apple products before the launch, pre-launch bookings, previous evening lines. That's what tends to happen when Apple tends to move its product into the market. And then of course, they scale it up stage-wise across all the countries. But the process is non-linear, they keep doing this process over and over again. And obviously, if we look at the uh, capitalization of Apple, if you look at the profitability of Apple, it stands out very clearly as an organization that is completely into the aspects of design thinking. I also would like to mention here, and as faculties, we must know this, maybe a lot of organizations are not formally design thinking organizations but they would be practicing the principles of design thinking for sure. And therefore the research says that mostly organizations that are design centric have 228% more stock market advantage as compared to organizations which are traditional in nature. Now looking at this, if we are able to create talent, which is a design thinking talent, we are actually helping organizations also become profitable. But I go back to my yesterday's conversation. I think engineering colleges and management colleges can use design thinking to interface with the industry and also make industry uh, profitable. And if that were to happen, then the academia and the industry interface will be extremely empowering for sure. Now we get into design thinking. Please keep posting your questions and I'll take them, as I said, uh, on the fly or as, when, when, when I come back from the break. The definition of design thinking is, the key word here is it's an empathetic methodology. That means the entire process is driven through 
absolute empathy. Now, what is empathy? Now, empathy typically is about stepping into someone else's shoes or whatever. But in design thinking, empathy for us as design thinkers is, are we able to understand the thinking of the person, the feelings of the person, the future plans of the person? And therefore, you know, understanding the consumer of innovation is something that design thinking constantly focuses on. I also mentioned yesterday a very interesting facet that mostly innovators are the ones who go wrong. And why do innovators go wrong? Innovators go wrong because they think their innovation is perfect. And because they think their innovation is perfect, a mm. lot of times their own beliefs about innovation brings the innovation out into the market and the market does not consume the innovation. We have a very interesting uh, statement that we keep making uh, every time we teach entrepreneurship and we say, and it, it, I learned it at the Wharton, uh, the dog must eat the food. Now, what does this mean? The dog must eat the food. If you made food for the dog, the dog must eat it, right? Now, if the dog is not eating the food, there's nothing wrong with the dog. There's something wrong with the food. And that is exactly what design thinking does. Design thinking through its empathetic methodology understands what is it that the consumer wants and structures the entire innovation process around the specific needs of the consumer only. And it's an ongoing process, like I said. So it's an empathetic methodology of prototyping. Prototyping is a very, very essential phenomena of design thinking. Whether you're prototyping a product, you're prototyping a service, or you're prototyping a solution. Even a solution to a complex problem is prototyped and executed. I will share a lot of stories as we move ahead. Uh, Madhuji, if you can mute yourself, please. Thank you. So let me share an example here. We're dealing with an industrial components elements company. And currently we are playing a role of transformation there. It's a complete engineering company. And uh, we realized that there was something happening, not with the product. They have best in the class product. And possibly that could also answer the earlier question on the automotive company that was posed. The product is exceptional for sure. However, there is some noise. Yes, I will share examples. Definitely I'll share examples. There is a product that is exceptional internationally, but there is a noise in the execution process within the organization. And because of the noise in the execution process of the organization, what was happening was that the organization was not being profitable. Now, when we were engaged as consultants there, we realized that the sales were happening, but the profits weren't happening. Now, if that is the situation, that means we were dealing with a complex human centric issue of certain processes or certain human behaviors not really working. And at that point in time, we got involved in the process, ran the entire empathy mapping there, and then we identified, and I'll explain to you as we move through the journey, I'll explain and elaborate on this case study further. We realized that the problem typically was at the level of processes failing, the ownership and accountability of people at every stage of the operations chain, there was some weak links there which were failing, which were reflecting badly on the, the outcome of uh, the entire supply chain that was running. That means the responsiveness of the supply chain or the, the way in which the supply chain would cater to the market was failing and the supply chain was also not working efficiently, which means the cost of operations, the plant itself was operating at a cost which is phenomenal in its own way. We prototyped a solution and the prototyping of the solution took 52 days. Now let's also understand this. Whenever we pick up a design thinking project, it has to be fast. Design thinking is all about being agile. Design thinking is about being absolutely top speed. 52 days. A set of 17 people in the organization came up and created a prototype. 
that prototype end of 52 days was launched within the organization after testing. We saw the probability score on the NPS or the net promoter score to be 85% for the prototype because of which we took a decision that we will move the prototype. And currently it's in process, but I'm sure that the results that would be seen uh, over maybe the next 30 days or 60 days that would bring about a lot of improvement because we are already getting into the second stage of the prototype now, obviously, because some indicators are showing and therefore leading and lagging indicators. These are the two indicators which are extremely important. I shall talk about it as we move, but the first level input. A leading in indicator is when you have a prototype which you're testing, if you get immediate results which are favorable, that's a leading indicator. And the lagging indicator ultimately is whether the objectives will be met. So it's an empathetic methodology of prototyping and testing solutions, which means the testing aspect of design thinking is very critical because innovations are expensive. And if innovations fail, we got a problem on hand. Uh, I was working with around 800 engineers of an engineering research center of an automotive company. And while we were working on innovation with them, one of the things that came out in the conversation was that you spend so much time building an automotive vehicle. And when the vehicle is created and it moves out of the R&D, if the vehicle fails in the market, it's a massive dent onto the organization's innovation process. It is also stated that more than 95% innovations tend to fail. And if more than 95% innovations tend to fail, it's important to keep testing at each stage and therefore ensure that any innovation that we bring about becomes successful. So it's an empathetic methodology of prototyping and testing solutions for intricate scenarios. Don't use design thinking, please, for simple solutions. It loses its value. In fact, the process will become extremely inefficient. And like somebody was saying yesterday, that it can get positioned as a jugard process. Well, if design thinking is not used efficiently at the right place, people can have misconceptions also about design thinking. And thank you for bringing that point out, because every time you bring the mindsets of people out on the chat, we are able to deal with it as consultants. It requires co-creation, which means design thinking cannot be done alone ever. Design thinking requires a set of stakeholders who participate in the process. And we are dealing with all areas of human complexity. Now, a lot of times engineering faculties tend to ask me, we're engineers, are we dealing with human complexities? We are all dealing with human complexities because anything that we manufacture, any product design that we create, anything that we do is solving a problem of some living entity or the planet. And therefore, engineering is value adding to the quality of the planet. And if you are value adding to the quality of the planet, we are human beings who reside on the planet directly or indirectly, we're getting impacted there. Where all design thinking works, therefore. Design thinking works in product design. Design thinking works in business value chains. Design thinking works in correction of supply chains. Design thinking works in consumer experiences. Design thinking helps in buying decisions. Design thinking helps to create exceptional technology products. In fact, we use design thinking extensively uh, on websites. And I personally design websites because I have a problem that most of the web designers don't understand what we do. So we are currently dealing with metaphors. We are creating an immersive technology, technology. helping people learn. Uh, we're helping people learn. Uh, all right. Vireshji, if you can just uh, mute yourself, please. Thank you. Virej, yeah, okay. So, a lot can be done, and there are a lot of areas in which design thinking gets applied. I personally can state one thing very clearly here having been in design thinking for the least last eight years, having been in design thinking for the last eight years. Uh, don't worry, uh, don't look for any annotation on this. 
I will definitely give you this entire content. Don't worry on that. Let's focus completely on what we're doing here. Design thinking applies to any engineering field. It applies to any management field. There was a very interesting question that got posed in the earlier faculty program. Are we making our engineers less efficient by taking them into what seems to be more like a management process? No, we're not. We're not. Like I mentioned yesterday, majority of the people who go through design thinking process or understand design thinking as a methodology are engineers. Not that non-engineers do not understand and appreciate design thinking. They can. But currently, the way I look at the trends in India, design thinking is mostly being used by engineers. But a lot of myths exist about design thinking. A lot of people believe design thinking is to do with fashion design. No, it's not. Though it can be used there. A lot of people believe design thinking is about creating user experience on websites. Just a part of it. Design thinking in terms of its definition is here. It is an empathetic methodology of prototyping and testing solutions for integrate scenarios requiring co-creation in all areas of human complexity. What are the keywords here? Empathetic technology, prototyping, testing, intricate scenarios, co-creation, and human complexities. As long as we are able to appreciate this, we're good to go on design thinking. If you have any questions, please post it on this for this slide on the chat and I shall take it when I come back. Fundamental to design thinking. Somebody asked the question yesterday on the logical and the abstract part of the work, and this is where I'm going to be uh, talking about design thinking. Design thinking. I mean, why is it that it becomes powerful? It becomes powerful because it uses both the hemispheres of the brain. Something, my man. My man. Uh, Mr. Pradeep, if you could meet yourself, please. Thank you. Uh, so, you know, in emotional intelligence, uh, when we look at the brain scans of people, we realize that whenever the brain is operating on anything that's a sense of purpose, something that's money, man. Uh, Mr. Pradeep, Professor Pradeep, if you can mute yourself. Okay, he's left. All right. Now, the brain comes with two hemispheres, the left and the right. And in design thinking, the process allows us to use both the sides, both the lobes of the brain effectively. Now, the brain comprises of four lobes, the, the, the frontal parts and the rear parts and the left and the right. That's how the brain gets partitioned. And we have neurons. If you notice uh, below underneath, I've talked about neurons. These neurons are constantly firing. We have trillions of neurons. We have trillions of neurons that we're born with. But research says that people leave the planet having used only a few million neurons. Now, why does that happen? Until and unless we keep doing new things, until and unless we keep solving complex problems, the neurons don't fire because we've got a brain wiring. The moment we have done something once, twice, thrice, the neurons form a relationship and they keep firing and that's called the neural pathways. Once a neural pathway is created, the neural pathway becomes more and more solid. The more we use it, the more solid it gets. And therefore what happens is people tend to do things which are comfortable to them, repetitive to them because the neural pathways are conditioned. What design thinking does is one, it creates a pathway of design thinking through the stages of design thinking that I talked about. But while we do that, it also ensures that we start solving a lot of complex problems. And when we are solving complex problems, a lot more neurons fire. And when a lot more neurons fire, the activity in the brain increases. And because the whole brain activity increases, we are actually sharpening. We are actually helping our brain do well. And very interestingly, brain is an organ in the human body. We got an eco coming. If you could mute yourself. <laughs> Professor Raju, could you mute yourself? You got a device that's facing a mic. Okay. So, where was I? All right. 
So when we were talking about the brain activity increasing, the human brain is the only organ in the human body which evolves continuously. But if the neurons are not firing, the brain can start decaying. Now, if we look at the way the brain is configured, if we look at the right brain function of the brain, it's about art, it's about creativity, it's about imagination, it's about intuition, it's about insights, synthesis of thoughts, and 3D forms. Let's take them one by one. Art. An artist is a right brain person. Now, is design thinking imaginative? Absolutely. Storytelling, like I was talking about yesterday, feeds to the right brain. Uh, visuals feed to the right brain. And that's where the artistic point of view happens in design thinking. The artistic point of view happens in design thinking also because we're dealing with abstract, we're creating something new. Creativity, the latent force in us, the Shakti within us, the force within us which allows us to innovate. Creativity is an aspect which gets triggered every time we are doing something which we've not done before and therefore it becomes a right brain activity. Imagination, frontal lobes. Whenever we look at future, whenever we look at creating something that has not been created before, we tap into our faculty of imaginations. Intuition. Now intuition plays a very important role when it comes to innovation. And how does intuition happen? We can never say I'm going to be intuitive tomorrow at nine o'clock. Intuition happens when you're not solving a problem, when you're doing something else, probably you're on a walk, you're, you're listening to music, or you're doing something else. Or maybe you're enjoying food. And at that point in time, a problem that you're dealing with, suddenly a flash comes to you, which can either come as a part of a thought, or it can come as a part of a feeling. And when you take that intuitive thought, you may actually be smashing a whole lot of assumptions in which a problem would be solved. Now, design thinking creates by process scenarios where people activate their right brain and intuition start happening during the design thinking process itself. And while I talk about that, when we come to tools, I will discuss that. But remember one thing that design thinking brings us into right brain and intuition plays a very critical role and intuition cannot be forced. Synthesis of thoughts. When you have different ideas that come and you want to synthesize those ideas into a prototype, though it may seem very logical in its own way, but when you are actually creating a prototype, which is a workable prototype, you're synthesizing certain thoughts, certain ideas, which is specific to the solution. And that becomes a right brain activity because that whole comprehension that is required, the cognition which is required at a broader level happens through the synthesis of thought. 3D. The brain gets extremely excited with 3D stuff. I'm going to talk about 3D printing uh, when we move into the technological aspects of prototype in the subsequent days. I'm going to talk about evolving technologies that are going to be used. So I'm going to talk about blockchains. I'm going to talk about 3D. I'm going to talk about quantum um, solutions. All that we're going to be talking about. We're also going to talk about 5G and quantum technologies coming together. But that's on the later part of the day. But let's understand 3D immersive experiences of prototypes are very critical when we're talking about design thinking. What is left brain? No offense meant, but our academics hones up our left brain completely. If you look at the entire analytical aspect of a brain, it's completely left brain. Oops. Just a moment. I'll just come back. Something happened. Just a moment, huh? All right. Let me just check uh, with Satish. Can you, Satish, can you ping me whether the screen is visible, please? Yes, it is. All right, thank you. So the left brain. In the left brain, what happens is it's analytical, it's logical. And like I was saying, our entire academic system is honed up in a way that we configure our left brain activity and we fire neurons of our left brain extensively. Language learned through grammar becomes a left brain activity. Language learned by children is a right brain activity. Reasoning is a left brain aspect. Science and math is left brain. Written and number skills are left brain. Now, the problem that happens here is uh, Divya Shriji, can you mute yourself, please? Thank you. 
Now, what happens in the brain is, if for an individual, if for an individual, only the left brain is active and is being used extensively, the left brain becomes more in terms of the neural pathways that are being created. And if a person is an artist, a musician, it, it's the right brain. Design thinking recognizes it. And therefore, what design thinking does is this. Now, don't worry too much about the 50-50 mix. We couldn't take the 100-100 mix. Therefore, 50-50 mix is being taken. What does it essentially mean? It essentially means that design thinking combines analytical thinking and intuitive thinking. This is how it works together. Now, if you see the left brain and the right brain superimposing themselves becomes the area of design thinking, which means what are we trying to say here? Analytical thinking is 100% reliable, which means that the accuracy of predictions, the accuracy and the precision with which the future can be forecasted, absolutely there. And in fact, when I talk about technologies and when I talk about data trends, we will realize that it is actually making our testing process a lot more uh, precise in its own way. Therefore, it's 100% reliable when we move into analytical. But it's 100% valid and in psychometrics, in human behavior, we talk about validity or in research, we talk about validity as, are you solving what you intend to solve? That means, is it approaching the context, the, the way the context has been, has to be approached? Is it, is it really, really dealing with the situation that it is supposed to deal with? That makes it absolutely valid because design thinking is focused completely on that situation. Therefore, the intuitive thinking, which synthesizes, which brings in cognition, which is pertaining to the context at work, makes it valid, 100% reliable. And because the left brain and right brain both are working together, design thinking becomes a combination of the two. Problem solving is a very, very clearly a left brain activity. Complex problem solving becomes a left and a right brain activity. So we were talking about critical thinking yesterday. Critical thinking is highly analytical in its approach and it's a very left brain driven, very masculine activity. However, imagination, uh, we're talking about abstract disruptive innovation, all that becomes right brain. And why does the abstract dis uh, uh, maybe disruptive innovations tend to fail or tend to take a longer time because they are so ahead of their time that a lot of times these products don't move into the market. And therefore design thinking controls the prototype in a way that the results are immediate. I want to give you another point. Every slide I'm going to give you a point. And the point here is that the results of a design thinking process should be visible in the next 90 days. If you're not getting the leading indicators in the next 90 days, that design thinking prototype is not being effective at all. That's how it goes. <coughs> when we teach design thinking, we take this as an example. And you may want to take this as an example for your students too. Look at the thread. It's so intertwined on an extreme end. Now, it's a thread that's completely wound up. It's very complicated. And we're trying to, you know, just get it out, make it a straight thread out of it. And that's what design thinking metaphorically is all about. I'm trying to trigger your right brain to understand what design thinking is. Now, when everything is intertwined in any organization, or when your student is wanting to, to indulge in a startup, at that point in time, the situation, the scenario seems extremely complicated, like the intertwined threads. It's so complex. Now, if we get into problem solving at this stage, it could actually become very difficult for us to really, really get onto this and you know deal with the intertwined threads. Sir, it is not audible, sir. Uh, can you, uh, Satish, am I audible? Yeah, absolutely, yes, sir, Niket, sir. you're very clear. Adam, would you like to check your connection, please? Yes, Thank yes, you. Sir. Yes, sir, it, it is yeah. correct, sir. Yes, I got it. <laughs> No problem. Technology always plays true and no problem. And that's why Satish and me, we keep working together so that we are able to do a check. Okay. But please do keep giving me feedback if you don't hear, because maybe I could also be wrong at my end. Huh? No problems at all. All right. 
Now let's get into this whole idea. Complexity of a startup. Let's say you're running the Atal Innovation Center in your institute, or maybe you're running incubators and accelerators for startups in your institute. At that point in time for the student, it's a very, very complicated idea, or maybe it's a final year engineering project. At that point in time, it seems to be a very complex idea because it's abstract. We don't know, it's all bundled up. We don't know how it's going to open up. And at that point in time, we do research. Don't we do that normally when we see the intertwined thread? We look at it, we decide what is to be done. And that's the whole idea of design thinking. We conduct research, the empathy mapping process. By the time the idea comes in as to how we would get the interviewing threads out, at that point in time, we prototype and we decide, okay, this is the way we're going to unbundle it. And therefore, the prototype is a single, simple solution, step by step, phased out in a way that ultimately it becomes innovation and it becomes a design that we can introduce into the market. Innovation typically commercially means monetization of any creative idea. Let's be very clear. Until and unless a creative idea is monetized, that means it's, it's converted into a commercial value. It is not taken as innovation at all. So if we were to look at the need of design thinking, it's the quest of continuous change that, that the reason is, and in fact, it becomes a lot more important in the post COVID scenario where things are changing at a very, very turbulent pace. In fact, my area of research in PhD is a world called VUCA, which is volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. We are in a world which is completely volatile, completely uncertain, extremely complex. Yes, I will answer your question on the left brain and the right brain. Don't worry, sir. It's so complex and it's so ambiguous that now organizations have to have talented design thinking professionals. The quest of continuous change demanded by the environment creates human dynamics. Now, what happens is because the environment around us is extremely complicated and complex, the human beings start behaving in a way that the, the entire response to the environment that we talk about starts deteriorating because we don't know how to deal with the situation. Now, when design thinking starts providing solutions, people are able to modify their behaviors correctly so that they can work on the problem on hand. So it's a dynamics that has complex needs, which underlies symptomatic problems. That means when we start a design thinking process, we're looking at symptoms. But when we look at symptoms, then we get into a root cause and we solve it. Therefore, it requires a repertoire of experience. Don't worry, I'll now simplify this definition further. So what are we talking about in the keywords here? One, design thinking is required because of continuous change. What is demanding this continuous change? The environment is demanding the continuous change. If the environment is demanding the continuous change, what is happening to human beings? They're becoming extremely complicated. They are not able to deal with the scenario and therefore the human dynamics change. Their needs become complex. They're only working on symptoms. They're not working on the root causes. And because the experience is limited in terms of logical only, they are not able to tap into the diversity because they're working alone. They're not working with people. So what are we saying? The need of design thinking is actually coming in because the world is changing, because the dynamics are changing, and there is an acute requirement to solve problems and come up with innovative solutions that will create the outcomes. And that is why design thinking becomes extremely important. There is a need right now in the industry. There is a need right now in the market because everything is changing. The environment is extremely dynamic. Human beings have to change their behaviors. They don't know what to do right now in the post COVID situation. And are organizations failing in the post-COVID situation? Yes, they are. The problem with a lot of organizations is they're dealing only with symptoms. They're not dealing with root causes. And therefore, they come up with wrong solutions. And in design thinking, when we come up with innovative solutions, it comes to the diversity of experience and using the left and the right brain together. Any questions on this slide, please post them. I'll take them when I come back from the break.
let's look at this. What is the concept of design thinking? You know, very interesting. We talk about, and it's an empathetic investigation of a wicked problem. It's a wicked problem that we are dealing with. Now, what's a wicked problem? One is there are straightforward problems, the simple problems, the complicated problems. But design thinking is a wicked problem. Wicked problems are cunning problems. Wicked problems don't have a straightforward, easy solution. And they're very deceptive. They're very deceptive because they throw up a solution through analysis, which is wrong solution. Now, you are requesting for certain uh, examples. Let me give you an example. We're dealing, we were dealing with an automotive company where during COVID times, when uh, the sales dropped, uh, the problem actually was that the sales had dropped, but it was a wicked problem. And what was the wicked problem? The product features were fantastic. There was no problem with the product. But the wicked problem was that there is COVID and because of COVID, people aren't buying. And that is what the wicked problem was emerging to be. And the solution that came out was discount, but discounts didn't work. Therefore, they came into a very, very clear war room of 21 days. Anupji, if you can uh, mute yourself, thank you. So they came into this war room of design thinking and they looked at this wicked problem and they created a prototype by which they were able to accomplish their objective of selling even during COVID times. So that's one of the examples of a wicked problem. Co-creating possibilities for solving problems. Like I said, design thinking is never done alone. Design thinking is co-creation. Multiple people collaborate together and they solve the problem. That's how it goes. Selecting solutions that can be rapidly deployed. That's your next aspect of design thinking. Normally in innovation, people tend to pick up a very, very complex solution which itself poses a lot of challenge in terms of being deployed. Now here what we're doing is deployment is not a problem because we are picking up a problem, we're creating a solution and that selected solution is rapidly deployed. And finally, the design thinking concept also says it's a prototype which is tested for hypothesis. So learning launch is a very important tool. We will talk about it a prototype for testing hypothesis before scaling it up. Now, what is testing for hypothesis? The hypothesis testing is a very, very important aspect of uh, the, the design thinking process where before you launch a prototype, you test it. You test it in a limited scale. You test it with limited stakeholders. And based on the results, you decide to invest in uh, scaling it up across the market or within the organization, or you choose to go back into the design thinking process and rework because the hypothesis proved that the alternative hypothesis that the product is not working actually came out to be true. So if you look at the concept of design thinking, what are we talking about? Wicked problem, co-creating, selecting solutions that can be adapted. Ranjitji, if you can mute yourself, thank you. Selecting solutions that can be rapidly deployed. And finally, the prototype for testing hypothesis, which is so critical because that's where the savings, that's where the earlier failures of any prototype can be predicted. These are the fundamental concepts around which design thinking tends to operate. Let's talk about the exploded uh, process of design thinking. We're going to spend some time on this. And after this, I will see the questions if time permits, and we will go for a break because these 10 steps will take us approximately 20 minutes to understand. And I'll give you stories at each of the stages. Design thinking for any innovation, the first intent is to define the challenge. And if I have to define the challenge, I have to run the process of empathy mapping where I do, I gather data. I gather data and unless I gather data, I cannot define the challenge. 
So the first stage. Good morning, sir. Say? I'm good. Okay. Okay. I think the gentleman is muted in, sir. Thank you. Okay, this can happen by the way, huh? if you're on a phone or if you're on a laptop and you receive any call, you may unmute yourself. And when you come back, that could actually start creating voice noise in this whole process that we're getting into. All right, coming back to this uh, process. Defining the challenge. That's our first part of the first stage of the process. So in order to define the challenge, what do we do? We gather the data and that gathering of data is a part of the empathy mapping process. Once we've done the empathy mapping, then we are able to come up with a definite problem statement. But like I said yesterday on the step three, the definite problem statement takes our brain into what is called as the task promotion network or TPN, which activates our left brain. But when we reframe it to, into a challenge, it's active. It's activating the right brain and the left brain both. And when it activates the right brain and the left brain growth, what happens is we are able to then get into the process of design thinking. Uh, Yashoda ji, if you can mute yourself, please. My thought process breaks, please. I think I'm getting a little old. <laughs> Need to be a little empathetic towards me. Thank you so much. All right. So we, so we reframe the challenge. And when we reframe the challenge, what happens is our left brain and the right brain both start getting activated, but we've created an opportunity statement. When we create the opportunity statement, it is important to now incubate the challenge statement or the reframed opportunity statement. What do we mean by incubating it? We rest it with the team for some time. Let the team digest, let the team understand what this entire opportunity looks like. Let them read up, let them go back, research on the area of opportunity. Let them come back with certain informed decisions that they would want to take when the design thinking process starts. Give, let me give you a story. Uh, we were working with a high precision instrument control company and they create, it's a Swiss company that creates very, very high-end sophisticated instrumentation control equipment. While we were working with them, the challenge that they were facing was that in the manufacturing capacity, the line was getting imbalanced because of continuous customization of components that were being done there. Because every product was highly customized in its own way. So what was the challenge? The challenge was that the line was not operating at the optimum capacity. It was a typical production manager's challenge. They came to us and they came to us seeking information as to how design thinking could help them. So we said, all right, let's, let's look at it. So we said, okay, can you go and talk to everybody on the shop floor and gather data as to where the capacities are not being utilized efficiently? They went back. They gathered a lot of data and that's where the empathy mapping process happened. They went and spoke to every... Chelsea, if you can mute yourself, uh, we're getting a lot of echo. Thank you. All right. So when we went into this whole idea of understanding what was it that the capacities were choking up for, and when we gathered the data, they came back and they said, that the opportunity lies in the area of going lean. Because what had happened over a period of time is that the production systems had gone beyond lean, they had become fat. Now, why does this happen? It happens because every system that operates tends to create inefficiencies in them. And in order to deal with the inefficiencies, we either hire people or we create a process or maybe, maybe we bring in another machine, another capital investment. With this happening, and maybe we can complicate our warehousing, we could also complicate the travel and the movement of the raw materials and of semi-finished goods across the shop floor. So there can be multiple things that could be happening. They went and asked the people who were on the shop floor in terms of gathering information, 
on what is happening while we are running this plant. When they came back after having understood that, they realized that the plant was no longer lean, the plant was no longer agile, the plant was no longer nimble. And by the way, it's a highly automated plant. It's a highly automated plant. Now, when they reframed the challenge saying that we need to relook at going agile and lean, and they identified certain areas where they wanted to go lean and agile, and I can't talk about that because it's under the non-disclosure non agreement, they incubated this thought. They allowed this thought to move in the organization. When this thought moved in the organization, the president of the organization decided, all right, we need to have a team which comprises of maybe these 20 people who are adequate, apt to deal with this particular opportunity statement. Now look at this. Had it been a problem statement that they would be working on, he would have picked up specialists to solve it. You know, the Ajay and the Vijay story that I gave you yesterday. But because he saw the opportunity statement, he said, okay, seems like I need to have people who are from vendor sourcing. I need to have people who are from materials management. I need to have people who are managing stores. I need to have certain people who are working as engineers on the shift. I need to have certain blue collar workers. And I may also need to have certain people in dispatches. The whole team was created. The team understood clearly what the opportunity statement looked like. And then they came into the process with us where the ideation process started, which is the step number five. When the ideation process started, now in design thinking, we don't use brainstorming. We don't use brainstorming. Please write this down. One of the reasons we don't use brainstorming is because there are extroverted people and there are introverted people. Introverted people cannot handle the noise that gets generated in a brainstorming session. Therefore, <clears throat> we tend to use post-it packs, the sticky notes. Now, what we do is we run this in multiple rounds. So I'm already giving you one tool now in form of the story. So there are 20 people in the room, five tables, each table having four people, clusters, circular tables, boards, or you may have walls, no problem at all. And we ran multiple rounds, which means we wrote the opportunity statement on the board and we said, okay, come up with ideas and no holds barred ideas. We ran round number one. All the sticky notes, one, one note of 20 people stuck on the wall. Second round, third round, fourth round, fifth round. And we said, doesn't matter if the ideas repeat themselves, no problem. Go ahead and make as many. We ran around seven rounds. It took us two hours to run these seven rounds. But end of seven rounds, we had 100 ideas that came out, which was stuck on the wall. When they realized that there were 100 ideas that came out and they were stuck on the wall and absolutely silently. In fact, I had people coming to me and saying, this is the first time peacefully we could actually generate ideas. And the best part is there's no discussion. There's no conversation happening on these ideas. And because there's no discussion, no conversation happening on these ideas, what is happening is that people are motivated to give their ideas because nobody is shooting down anyone's idea. Then we took them into the process of evaluating and refining the ideas. So when we took them into the process of evaluating the ideas, we said, all right, now let's put these ideas together and see where the repetition is happening. Wherever repetition was happening, these were the high frequency ideas. And therefore we were already evaluating, probably these ideas will result in success. We put the ideas in what is called as the affinity diagram, where similar ideas were clustered together and those similar ideas after evaluation, which are clustered together from those clusters, we pulled out ideas, which became the step number seven of prototyping. We pulled out high frequency, easy implementation. Remember this low hanging fruits is an essential aspect of design thinking. We did not pick up ideas which are complicated and complex because in design thinking, we say when the fruit is available on the lower branch, why climb the tree? We picked up for phase one prototype, the low hanging fruits, created a prototype. That prototype was a mind map. We'll talk about the mind map tool as we move ahead. 
Then that prototype was assessed for outcomes and refining. That means internally within the group, it was tested whether they would want to see the prototype. And after that, the assessment went out to the stakeholders and we took a statistical score on that. And when the score was taken, that score at times may tell you you need to refine the uh, prototype. But since we had controlled the design thinking process effectively, we didn't have to refine it. <coughs> the implementation of the line balancing happened on one product line. It happened on one product line. They did not cascade it to all the products. It was tested on that particular product line. And after it was tested, it was implemented across all the product lines. But remember the 10th step of iteration. While they did implement this process, this process brought out another set of inefficiencies. And that became the next part of the design thinking process. So whether it is Kaizen, whether it's total quality management that we talk about, design thinking also becomes a tool for continuous improvement plans or CIPs, or it can be also a part of the entire aspect of Kaizen. It can also be a part of total quality management and therefore management graduates and engineering graduates, if they can use this as a tool which fits in there, it's going to be beautiful. This is your exploded process of design thinking. It gets crunched into the five stages that we talk about on empathy or empathize, define the problem or definition, ideation, prototype, test, and scale. A lot of times in design thinking, scale, the sixth factor, is not considered. So a lot of times you have models that go with these five parts, and the five parts are empathize, define, ideate, prototype, test. And then there are these models which talk about the sixth part, which is scale. I want to say one thing for sure in this slide. Whenever you're scaling anything in design thinking, in today's world, technology becomes a very, very crucial element there because technology helps us to scale big time. I think in all the design thinking projects that I have conducted, 40 of them over the last eight years, every design thinking project, we brought in technology. And the reason the technology was brought in is because it raises the productivity levels. And there are a lot of things that human beings may not be able to do, which technology can solve, and therefore it makes sense. So design thinkers also need to be adept at how the technology is moving. I think design thinkers need to be voracious readers. They need to be researchers. They need to be well-informed in terms of how the world is moving. This is the design thinking process of innovation. I am going to elaborate on these tools when we come back from the break. I've created a presentation for you, which talks about 10 critical tools. And like I keep saying, you can always explore the tools, but giving you a, a perspective of what we're going to be doing post 1130 is what I would like to take you through. Ethnographic research. Now, what is ethnographic research? It is about watching. It is about interviewing people in a controlled environment. Very critical when it comes to solving very complicated design thinking problems. <clears throat> Let's say I'm working on a particular product, you know, and if I'm working on a particular product, I know that product is going to solve or that idea of the product is going to solve something for a human being. I go out and I look at that sample, which I'm going to add value to, and I keep watching them over a period of time to understand what they're doing. In fact, a lot of times we don't even know when we enter a mall, there are a set of people who represent a particular company or a brand. They're watching us. They're watching us. How are we deciding? What are we doing? Our micro motions, our expressions are being watched. Our movements in the mall are being watched. And I come from analytical background. I'm certified on digital analytics. And I can say this with confidence that what happens is in today's scenario, consumer behavior is becoming a very, very critical part of analytics. In fact, our phone, you would realize 
that if you're planning a travel and if you were to search for a city, suddenly you start getting offers on hotel deals. Now, what is this? This is ethnographic research. People are not watching you, but your digital movements and your footprints are being captured by people. So ethnographic research happens in a controlled environment. Stories and storytelling, I've talked about it a lot of times. I don't think we need to spend too much time on this. But like I said, grandparents, the stories, the metaphorical, you can arrive at your own conclusions about the story, very powerful, they trigger the right brain. Customer journey mapping, amazing tool. I've been using this extensively for product designs. I've been using this extensively. In fact, Google talks about something called a Zmot or Zmot, zero moment of truth. And they say that 80% of decisions, and this could be important for uh, academic institutions, because when parents are looking for where their child should go, their ward should go for studies, 80% of decisions are today happening on the internet. And if we map the customer journey effectively, and if we provide those inputs as an experience already, whether it is an immersive experience or an analytical experience or pure data that we can give to people, the first call is a closure call. We do that in our organization. Uh, uh, if you can mute yourself, please. So, Nayanaji, can you mute yourself, please? Thank you. All right. So, the customer journey typically captures the entire behavior of the customer right through, and it can be used for correcting an issue. It can also be used for creating products. And by the way, if an engineer is wanting to create a machine or is a part of uh, maybe even the maintenance team where he's supposed to rectify the machine, he can actually watch the behaviors of the people and based on that, either come up with a maintenance manual, oops, maintenance remedies, or it can they can come with a new product, which is a new machine. That's the way it goes. Visual tools, which allow brainstorming. Like I said, we put the, uh, in my earlier story, we talked about it. We put the, uh, the opportunity statement on the board, and then we ran the brainstorming through the posted or the sticky notes. Visual tools work very well. Pictures work very well. Prototyping. Can we mute ourselves, please? It's a prayer. Every yes, time we have to request people to mute. Can can the organizers do something, please? Thank you. So prototyping, we consolidate ideas into a single, easily implemented product. Can you mute yourself? Thank you. And one of the tools that gets also talked about is hypothesis or the learning launch, which I will talk about explicitly as we move through. This is what we test for when we are getting into prototypes, and this becomes an important tool again. <clears throat> what are we testing for? Whether we created a process, whether we created a product, whether we have solved a complex problem. First, is it creating business value? Because like we saw in our first slide, design thinking is about profitability. And if it is about profitability, it needs to create business value. What is business value? Something that you do new, which is going to help you monetize and bring you the wealth that is required. Acceptability. Is that particular prototype acceptable to your stakeholders? That's your next test. What is the point in coming up with a prototype that's not accepted either by manufacturers, if it's a pre-production prototype, or by the end consumer, if that particular consumer is going to consume the prototype? Now let's talk about civil engineering. I mean, I had a very interesting question that came up last time by one of the civil engineers. And he asked me this. If there is a particular apartment or a particular building that's been created, how does design thinking come into play? First, 
I would certainly look at the customer of mine, the demographics and the psychographics of my customer. Go do an empty mapping, come back, and then create with my architect a layout. But where is the acceptability part coming in? The business value is generated. Like I said yesterday, that show apartment where people come and they test the prototype as to how the flat would look like, that is the acceptable part of the prototype. If it's acceptable, fine. If it's not acceptable, we go back into the non-linear process and we bring about a correction. Scalability. Is this particular prototype scalable across the market, across the organization? Execution. Do we have the requisite skills and competencies available within the organization? And ultimately the monetization capability over a period of time because our prototype is not going to be short lived. It may create a business value there, but is there a journey of monetization that we can talk about? Because innovations are amortized, right? Innovations are amortized over 10 years, over 15 years. Pharmaceutical companies that I work with, they take 10 years to create a product. But interestingly, during, during COVID time, the vaccine was created so instantly. I don't know how they crunched it. I haven't done any study on that. But monetization capability, are we able to monetize it sustainably over a period of time? If the prototype passes these five steps, that means the prototype testing is done. We normally convert this into a scale. We keep getting the scores on this. And then with the scores, we decide what is it that is working? What is it that is not working? We may choose to fine tune the prototype or we may tend to just say, all right, let's go with it. A story. Now, since this is not controlled under non-disclosure agreement, this is my story of design thinking. I will give you everything possible in this case study. We will talk about this case study and then uh, we will take a break. <clears throat> if you can mute yourself, please. I will join after. Uh... Professor Videsh, if you can mute yourself, please. Thank you. I will join my learn party. Okay. I hope the mute is happening. Yes, sir. Okay. So we had a challenge. You know, we were working on this whole idea of knowledge bite stories. And what was the challenge? The challenge was every time as a trainer, I went out and I taught people. After that, they keep kept coming back with a lot of questions. And again, the engagement of mine with them started depleting after the coaching or the training process got over. So I wanted to ensure that we remained connected with them. Okay, no problem. Thank you. So the challenge that we had was one, the retention of learning. And by the way, for faculty is here, it could be an interesting case study because retention of learning is something that's so critical for us. We went out and we gathered data. We understood what our customer was looking for. And we realized that because we work mostly with fortune companies, we had customers who were extremely tech savvy. They were consuming videos. They were consuming audios. <clears throat> we said, why can't we create 10 minute, 12 minute stories of remarkable people that we've met <coughs> that we've studied and convert that into a video story. We reframed the challenge of retention not happening and uh, the relationship breaking down into a opportunity statement. Can technology be used to extend the learning and to ensure that the relationship keeps generating uh, subsequent revenues? We incubated that particular uh, challenge statement, the opportunity statement within our organization. And we said, we've got all the technology available within our organization. Can we start doing videos? We started doing videos. And by the way, at that point in time, before COVID, I was literally living out of my suitcase. I, I was traveling all over and I was virtually had nothing to do with the evenings in the hotel because I was alone in the room. And I said, can I use the hotel room now to create videos? And therefore I sat with my team and the stage number five happened where we decided certain set of areas 
where we would generate these short 12 minute to 15 minute videos. These were stories that we made. We came in, we evaluated it. We evaluated the value creation that we did. And then what happened was that, oops, we have some people. Sandeep Kumar ji, can we request you to mute? Thank you. We evaluated and refined. We went back to our customers and we asked them, is it okay that uh, uh, we generate these videos for you? We took a clearance from them. We generated a prototype of live video broadcasts. We uploaded them on a cloud-based system called Vimeo and started running analytics because Vimeo permits me to run analytics worldwide. And I can say this with so much of confidence and so much of happiness that during the COVID time, these videos saw a boost of 300%. Today, these videos are being consumed all over the world and we are able to monitor each city and each video. But obviously, because of the privacy norms, we don't get down into the IP addresses of people. But I have all the data that I need as to where the videos are being consumed. So that's how we iterated. We kept taking a feedback, we take keeping an evaluation. And with that first initiative of ours, ultimately, we moved into creation of more than 100 videos. Not only did we stop there, but I started podcasting and there are around 200 plus podcasts today out in the market with 1 million people listening to them. And I'm going to give you audio podcasts on design thinking, which your students can listen to so that your teaching also becomes easy. These are audio podcasts of 10 minutes, 12 minutes being consumed everywhere. And we've converted that into an audio learning program now, and we started monetizing it at $1. Now you can imagine Satish is the president of the company who looks after my e-learning uh, protocol. And <coughs> he is going all over $1 per training program. And then we've created a bucket of $10 where we packed up all the training During programs the together. Meliota sends his guilt under the aforementioned Holy Knight spear heading to the village and goes out. Outside, he finds Elizabeth, who, having made many mistakes, we've got some video starting in the background for somebody. Thank you. All right. So that's how it works. That's how we brought in this whole concept of the uh, knowledge bite stories that coach and these stories actually started working beautifully for us. I'm willing to take questions on this as we move ahead. Design thinking application, like I said, no holds barred. Design thinking can be applied everywhere. Product innovation, service innovation, process innovation. Maybe your engineers, after some time, grow in life, become leaders. They will start doing business model innovation because business model innovation is also about what products, what kind of processes, what kind of systems, what kind of supply chains, what kind of business value chains. We're going to talk about all that as we move through over the days. And problems pertaining to human dynamics. In fact, in Hubli, I did a major project on healthcare, design thinking in healthcare. You may want to search for the video. It may be available somewhere on the internet. In fact, if you search for me on the internet, you may get a lot of content which I don't carry because a lot of places where people invite me, they convert my talk into videos and they're available all over the place. So feel free to even check that out. Maybe you can use that as a case study also. <clears throat> it's all about doing better with lesser. And remember this, it's about failing early and winning quickly. <clears throat> That's how the design thinking as a process works. Great. This was my first part of the conversation. I'm sure Satish would have consolidated the questions which I will take when I come back from the break, but I have five minutes with you. I want to capture all the learning yes sir we will break at 11 30 sharp five minutes oh don't worry you don't need to apologize uh, for being unmuted it happens don't worry at all I mean, there's, no, there's nothing that goes wrong all right what did we learn in the first part we learned commercialization of questions sir yeah absolutely put your question here i will certainly take it when we're back from the break 
I don't want to mess up people's break. I'm going to devote full 20 minutes. When we come back from break, you can unmute yourself. You can have a conversation with me uh, while uh, you would want your questions. No problem at all. <clears throat> what did we learn? You might want to take these notes. Design thinking, profitable organizations. Big brands are using design thinking. Design thinking is for complex human problems. We're living in a volatile market. We're living in a volatile economy. And therefore, we need to solve complex problems and turbulences. Five steps of the design thinking process, which ultimately got exploded into 10 steps. But the five steps are empathize, define, ideate, prototype, test. And the sixth one would be scale. We also talked about technology being a part of the scale. We talked about design thinking being applicable across all the areas of business, including management, including engineering. Therefore, I know there are some faculties here who come from B schools. I think business managers definitely need to learn design thinking because if the world tomorrow is going to demand people with the core competency of design thinking, we are providing the world with the ready students who can actually use it in design thinking. Don't worry, uh, I am giving this debrief from the faculty point of view. You will scale down when you talk about it to the students, but like a teacher, <clears throat> I'm talking to teachers here and <clears throat> I have to respect the intellect and the knowledge of the teachers. Therefore, don't worry, we will bring it down to the first semester student level. Don't worry, but you must know what design thinking is completely. We also talked about the fact that design thinking is about fail early. <laughs> All about creating quick win also that's what we talked about when it came to design thinking we've also talked about the fact that design thinking is now a futuristic competency that organizations would need to nurture and we also said design thinking projects are being run by organizations today live and industry academicia can work together and if your students are also part of it. They're getting real time experience. In terms of the. Uh, what they would be doing after they pass out from your college. How do we implement design thinking to basic sciences? I will deal with that. In fact, any field of science, either you're creating pure knowledge or you're creating. Some kind of an abstract process or something which is of relevance to the market. You can actually crunch your area of research in science areas in the field of science also with design thinking. We will talk about that when we come back. All right, so we're talking about tools. I'm gonna typically talk about tools which are popularly used. I'll give you some stories around it also. Nothing stops you from using tools uh, which are yours. You can design, you can develop your own tools. I think what I like about design thinking is completely flexible. Design thinking, a scientific process using flexible tools. Like I said, go ahead, use whatever tools you want. Go ahead, pick up any tools you want uh, and you can design your own tools. Each of the tools can be used anywhere. That's why I put this slide. You can use it at empathize stage. You can use it at define stage, ideate stage, prototype and test it. Now, this presentation has been made using technology. That means, this particular presentation is available for public use and I do get analytics in terms of which presentations are being consumed, when, how much time, how many times, how popular they are. So this entire presentation is also going through the uh, center of virtual excellence that I've created on design thinking. It's available there. Don't need to take any screenshots. You can refer to this presentation on the fly. Don't worry at all. You can use it in your training sessions also. You can use it in your classroom sessions also. Don't worry. And I'm not controlling with any IP. You don't have to give any credits to me. You can teach it your own way. So the tools apply at the stage of empathizing. They apply at the stage of defining. So when you're learning about your audience, you can use the tool. When you're constructing a point of view of defining the problem and the opportunity statement, you can use it. Uh, Ideate, you can use the tools for, for brainstorming sessions that you're conducting. Prototyping, you can use the tools. And for testing, I've got a set of tools that will come to you separately. 
tool number one. So it's 1210 by my watch. Uh, we will continue with this till 1245 and 1245 I'll start taking questions. Tool number one, storytelling. I think I've told you a lot of stories. And like I said, stories always start with once upon a time. Now, how do we use storytelling as a tool? Very interesting. People go out, talk to the stakeholders and come back and create a comic strip, a caricature or a simple story, a vocal story that they would narrate. And it always starts with once upon a time. Now, you don't have to give a story as faculties. Your students can go talk to the world and come back and tell all the participants of design thinking a story. And this story is about the complex problem, which is human centric problem. You're building a story around that problem. For instance, giving you a story. Uh, I created my own e-learning uh, portal, which has got all the titles that I was talking about. Now the story goes like this. I was doing my certification on entrepreneurship with Wharton and it was required that we generate a portal. I gave you that story yesterday. I'm just giving you how it gets done here. And therefore the company got pivoted and therefore I got into technology. I had the content. I put the content together and we released the portal out into the market. A very short story. Now let's say I talk about this story in an elaborated way to people and I want to conduct a further upgradation of my portal. This story becomes a trigger to create diverse thoughts in my team, create insights in my team, create ideas in my team. Storytelling by far in design thinking is taken to be one of the most profound tools that ever got used. <clears throat> Some people are not normal storytellers, are not usually good storytellers, but like I keep saying, storytelling comes naturally to everybody. The more we practice it, the more it becomes easy for us. Caricatures are easy to draw for somebody, not easy to draw for somebody. Therefore, in design thinking workshops, we always tell people who are good in drawings to come and draw a comic strip, strip a storyboard, a caricature board, all that they're able to put. So storytelling is your first tool. Second tool, empathy map gives you a complete insight into the stakeholders mind and actions. If you see on the left hand side in the empathy mapping, we've created four quadrants. What is the person who's got exposed to the problem saying? What is the person who's got exposed to the problem thinking? What is the person who is exposed to the problem doing to deal with the problem? And what is the person exposed to the problem feeling? These four quadrants give you absolute data. And on the top, you would see an image. On the top, you would see an image. That image is another way of doing. So one is you can have four quadrants or you can have a circle and four sections around it where you can detail out through the post-it notes. Uh, what is it that the stakeholder is saying? What is it that the stakeholder is thinking? What is it that the stakeholder is doing? And what is it that the stakeholder is feeling? Normally, this tool is done in a room where people are brought in. They have gone out into the market, interviewed a lot of people. I normally do appreciative inquiry for interviews. Even that particular thing will be available to you. Don't worry. They come back with say, think, does and feel. They sit in the room, they make the post-it pads and then post-it notes and then they stick it up. Or they could get onto the phone live in the room, conduct interviews in the room, make post-it notes and put them on the board themselves. This is how an empathy map is created. Why is an empathy map created? When you see the board in its totality, it starts triggering your right brain and it starts triggering a whole lot of ideas in your mind. A lot of times in the empathy map, what the stakeholder says, thinks, does and feel may also start giving you a lot of ideas to solve a design thinking problem. Customer journey or the stakeholder journey. 
another important tool. Now, whether you're an engineer or you're a business school graduate, you're dealing with people. And when you're dealing with people, you can either call it a customer journey or you can call it a people journey. Now, if you're looking at a customer journey on the left hand side, you would see there is a discovery of the customer. There is an evaluation. So it's like this, the customer discovers you, the company or the product through whatever social media or referencing word of mouth, whatever evaluates. So there may be content, there may be white papers, there may be everything available by which the customer is able to evaluate. Then the customer gets into buying. And then the customer based on the buying experience becomes an advocate. And then that results in bonding. Now imagine if your engineering student just understands this, <coughs> that there is a customer journey and your student maps this journey, comes in and does a project for a particular startup product or a startup idea that, they, that he or she has and they map the customer journey and they put this mapping of the customer journey in form of a storyboard in form of a story that means you can combine two tools together and if that story were now to be available in a visual way it starts creating a platform for us to start creating ideations and prototypes you can also build a story for the prototype and take the story out which is again a customer journey as to how the customer journey would be if the prototype were to be successful you can start taking calls in terms of responses and uh, you know whether the prototype is going to be successful or not successful so customer journey customer empathy map is something also it is called extremely effective sorry okay tool number four visual thinking visualization triggers amazing ideas now your engineering drawings your product drawings machine being seen a 3d image an immersive experience of 3d in technology these visual triggers are amazing in fact today learning processes are now moving into digital books where if a kid is learning a b c d and the d is a dinosaur and the kid touches the D, the dinosaur pops out in 3D and the kid learns like that. 3D, visual, triggers our neurons very effectively. And therefore, a lot of times, a problem in its three-dimensional form is also shown to people. And when problem in its own three-dimensional form is shown to people, it starts triggering the right brain. In fact, left brain activity happens in isolation when there is no visual trigger. So visual is another part. Visual can be a model, like for instance, in architecture, since there was a question on architecture, the, the layout model, the scale down model, which could be a thermocol model or maybe a wooden model, that is something that is a visual. Or it could be a, a, a model that is created in a software, even that works. So visual triggers, Excellent in their own way. Fifth one, value chain. I'm going to talk about this in my subsequent sessions for sure. But if you look at the organization's value chain, we talk about, you know, areas like manufacturing, we talk about marketing, we talk about R&D, we talk about uh, the customer feedbacks coming in. We talk about after sales service, we talk about sales. So if you look at the entire organization per se, and this could seem a lot more management. So maybe B schools can use this uh, tool. Maybe engineering colleges may not want to use this as a tool. Value chain management, value chain analysis is also another tool that gets used by organizations when they're doing design thinking process, where they look at what's working, what's not working. And it's also used on business process re-engineering. In fact, this week, last week only, I wrote an article on LinkedIn on how to re-engineer business processes with design thinking. If you're interested, you can certainly have a look at that. My map, I'm gonna spend some time on this because whether you come with a B school background or you come with an engineering institutional background, Mind maps are amazing. Mind maps are amazing because Tony Buzan, who's the creator of the mind maps, 
if you see on the left hand side the image in the center you have the definition of the problem maybe as a visual also and then you have the threads coming out and those threads then move into secondary threads and the tertiary threads so let's say there is the first thread which is coming out which is the application thread now around the application thread all the ideas i mean i don't use mind mapping for problem definition i use the fishbone or the ishikawa framework which i will talk about later but mind maps are fantastic for creating prototypes what i like about mind maps is it's free flow normally the way i run a mind map tool is it can be either run on a laptop where you have a lot of mind mapping uh, tools available for free also and people remote can actually start generating mind maps or it can be on the board now when it's on the board i permit everybody to come in with pens of different colors and colors are very important in mind map because colors trigger the right brain they are free to work on any thread somebody can work on application somebody can work on development somebody can work on failure or a feature they can they can work on any thread that they want as the ideas come they can put the ideas into those uh, different threads this becomes infinite i have run mind maps for one full day and we've had hundreds of ideas being written on the mind map now what happens when you do mind maps on the top if you see on the mind map when it is constructed you can actually circle your priority areas you can erase certain areas you can park certain areas you can also decide how you want to scale your prototype based on the ideas in the mind map so some of the ideas can be put as stage 1 ideas some as stage 2 ideas and then you start extracting the ideas and you make mini mind maps and those mini mind maps become your prototypes i use mind maps extensively in prototyping and i strongly submit to you please use mind maps extensively in prototypes any questions that you have please start posting them because end of the session i would be taking questions for sure ishikawa or the fishbone analysis very critical for problem definition now typically since people are coming from an engineering background i'm putting it on the picture on the top you could actually have the man machine the method the materials being used the money factor all that put together in the ichikawa framework and uh, you can use any more elements or you can lessen the elements whichever way you want the head of the fish is the problem the bones the primary bone is the main bone then you have the secondary bone which are the uh, themes and then you have the tertiary bones and on the tertiary bones you can link up all the root causes that are element that are emanating from all the interviews that you're conducting and then you do a pictorial view of the fishbone analysis now this is what happens when i teach organizations fishbone and i use them in design thinking by the way fishbone analysis is one of the uh, quality tools i don't use annotation because i don't really like the dirty slides i like to keep them clean so how do i use this like i said it's one of the tools identified in uh, problem solving skills proven tool for sure japanese companies use them extensively in their processes i let people go out either in a controlled environment where they meet up with people talk to people or they conduct structured interviews they come back and then they put the fish bone now i'll give you a interesting uh, student story i was staying teaching in a b school a specialization course on design thinking and uh, very interestingly there was a group of students who wanted to create a product out of snake venom amazing idea snake venom poison and they said that there's an established market in pharma companies in uh, various other industries where the snake venom is required but transportation of the snake venom in a controlled environment and also curating the snake venom 
is a very cumbersome process. So the complex problem that they were dealing with was monetization of snake venom. That was on the head. Then on the secondary bones, they picked up identifying the snakes, creating a place where the snake venom can be curated, supply chains, retail, uh, licensing, controlled environment of shipment, all those root causes were taken. And then what happened was, with the fishbone analysis and all the root causes detailed there, they actually conducted an ideation session. And in the ideation session, they were able to create a prototype. And the person, the student was so passionate about this project of design thinking that I believe, because that student told me in the Viva when he presented the prototype to me, that he's not going to take up a job. He's going to actually go out and create this as an entrepreneurial venture. I think he went looking for funding and because the prototype was ready and the market was ready, he had already done the hypothesis testing. Things worked out for him. This is the power. You never know. You may actually create students who become entrepreneurs right out of the college. And is India ready for entrepreneurship? Absolutely. So design thinking uses fishbone also to identify the root causes. Tool number eight, quick prototype, rapid prototype if you wish. A concept that you bring out from all the ideas, it's a proof of concept. It could be a low fidelity prototype, as simple as a sketch. Normally not a high fidelity prototype, but it gets into detailed engineering drawing. It's a sketch and from the sketch you get into a high fidelity prototype. A proof of concept typically is used at the first level in design thinking to test whether the concept is acceptable to the stakeholders or not acceptable to the stakeholders. And we normally use proof of concept as a methodology to do statistical testing. And once it is cleared, then we would actually move into a detailed prototyping. That means empathy, empathize, define the problem, ideate, proof of concept, test the proof of concept, then come into prototyping and then you test the prototype. That's how it works. So proof of concept, quick prototype is another thing that is used. Assumption smashing. I use it extensively in my ideation sessions. I have found this tool extremely useful there. Now this is how it works and I'm going to use the the mannerism of the brain also to understand how assumption smashing works. Now, a lot of times, whenever we are conducting ideation sessions, people come up with ideas which are known ideas. So we don't ask them not to give the ideas. In fact, we encourage them to come up with known ideas. These are tested ideas which people believe in strongly. They come very rapidly. This comes from a conscious mind, the layer of the conscious mind. And like Einstein said, that more than 90% of our brain is unconscious brain or the subconscious brain. We don't really use that. And therefore we tend to use only one or 2% of our total mind capacity or the brain capacity. I do the first round, which is based on rational ideas, People come rapidly and give those ideas. Then comes a time when they're exhausted and they say, we have no more ideas. And the moment they say, we have no more ideas, I say, all right, all these ideas are now puffed. We are not going to use these ideas. Now let's get into ideas which are beyond these ideas. Now they have to think. They have to think to create an idea. And the moment you have to think to create an idea, you started moving into your subconscious mind. You are literally testing your brain and you're firing neurons now because in that earlier process, you fired neurons which are already existing. Now you're attempting to fire new neurons, new ideas. We record them, but we don't stop there because that's still not assumption smashing. These are ideas somewhere that you have implemented in the past and you know that you worked. We stop the process there and we say, all right, let this sink in, come back tomorrow and we are going to come up with some very simple 
and extremely ridiculous ideas. I'm sorry, I don't have any other word to use. Therefore, I'm using the word ridiculous and it is licensed word as far as innovation is concerned. Because when we talk about innovation and assumption smashing, this is used. So, they come back on the next day and they come up with absolutely simple, absolutely some kind of ideas which people will start laughing at. These are laughable ideas. People may even ridicule these ideas and those ideas are listed. And interestingly, every time we have even put one idea of that kind in, I'll give you a very simple example uh, with one of the largest automotive company in India. I was running an innovation lab. And in that innovation lab, I still remember in the testing area of the automotive vehicle, they had to go around for hours together till the tire burst. They wanted to see at what speed and at what durability factor of the tire would there be a tire burst in the vehicle. It used to take them God alone knows how much time it was not predictable. So in the innovation lab, when we were using assumption smashing, one person sitting there came up with an idea. Can we put a bottle of acid on top of each of the four wheels and let the acid drop with the driver not knowing about it at all? And therefore, we increase the wear and tear of the tire and the tire would burst. They were planning to buy machines worth crores. And this problem was solved with a simple acid. Now, which acid they used, I do not have visibility for that because the person who came up with the idea said, I'm a chemist and I know what to do with this, but I'm not going to disclose it because you might use this in other sessions and I don't want you to do that. I respected that and, you know, a simple idea. And you know what? This idea was implemented in a few thousand rupees. That means they were looking at spending crores and a few thousand bucks they were able to do it. Simple and assumption smashing very powerful. Even if one assumption smashed idea comes into a prototype, the prototype can be extremely successful. Learning launch. I'm going to take this up as we move through in the process because learning launch is a part of the prototyping process. Saves time, saves money. We use key success drivers to do this. I talked about that business value that gets created. Do we have the expertise within our own organization? That is called the defensibility. Is it going to generate the money? So in a learning launch, what I want to talk about right now on this slide is you choose under what factors do you want to, to test the prototype? You choose it. Once you decide on the factors under which a particular prototype has to be tested, do two things. What are the immediate factors and what are the factors that will result ultimately as accomplishment of objectives? Let me give you a very interesting insight on the launch. While I was doing my certification in analytics, there was a very interesting case study. And by the way, case studies are stories. There is something called as an all-star team of footballers in the US. Now, the players who were being picked up in the all-star team were the ones who had scored maximum goals, saved maximum scores, uh, goals, or had given some interesting passes which resulted in goals. These were the factors on which they were running the process of selection. They realized that most of these players could play only one or two matches because they wouldn't perform after that. Then they realized probably it's a complex human centric problem. Things are not working out. A wise guy who was into analytics came in and said, let's change the success drivers. Can we look at a driver, which is the total contact time of the ball with the foot? Now they changed it from the number of passes, number of saves and number of goals to the maximum contact time of the ball and the foot. This became a leading indicator. They picked up players now based on this leading indicator of the contact time of the ball. What was the lagging indicator? The lagging indicator was tested real time, whether they played multiple matches. 
and you know they actually played multiple matches because what happened was because the success factor identified was the correct one the selection became correct which means that in a launch process which is a learning launch and that's why on the left i've written learn in a launch process whenever you are talking about testing a prototype be very clear against what measures are you testing a prototype because a wrong measure could give you amazingly right results but the prototype could fail and possibly this is where you as professors your experience as professors will help your students because your students may come up with wrong drivers completely learning launch prototype testing is one of the most critical areas of design thinking i've given you 10 tools you're free to pick up your own tools you're free to do whatever you wish to do but this message that i have put there is so clear and crisp keep developing tools and experiment with design thinking